conducted with Stanley M. Shaw, Professor Emeritus of Nuclear Pharmacy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, August 12, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Okay, well, I was born in uh, 1935 on the hottest day of the summer, according to my mother, which was July 4. Uh, Tell us the city and state. It was a little town called Parston, South Dakota, uh, one square mile and a farming community. Uh, my father ran a gas station and delivered uh, fuel oil to the farmers, and my mother helped as well, so it was sort of a mom-and-pop gas station, and it's a place where I worked as a young man. Uh, they never had any other children. Uh, my mom was bar married late to my father, and in 1935, uh, you just didn't think about having children in your 40s, so I was the only one. Okay. What was school like? Where did you go to tell you earlier? Well, they had a school, a school uh, uh, in the town, uh, which uh, uh, was a, a decent size, but decent meant to me about a class of 35 to 40. And, but in comparison to some country schools out around us, it was large. And so my whole education was in that little town of Parkston. And we started in grade school and one level, and you went up to high school, which was on the second level. And uh, Meaning the same building? Same building. Uh, it was a, a style in those days. Uh, I uh, was an okay student, uh, not super student, but good enough. And... Uh, I couldn't play sports, so I was in band and choir and chorus and plays. And, and you know, it's very interesting because a, a gentleman, when I was a freshman, uh, a high school a teacher who was in speech and drama, took me aside and he said, why don't you try one-act plays and drama? And, and I, a uh, very bashful, awkward little guy, and I thought, oh, I don't know, but he convinced me. And what he did was a tremendous favor because for all four years I was in plays and, and on stage and it really prepared and helped me for a teaching career, which of course I had no idea <laughs> no, that, that was going stage to be my life. life. Right. So it was very interesting. And then a chemistry professor uh, who was the principal as well uh, took me aside when I was a senior. And frankly, earlier in that, they did these tests and he said, you know, Shaw, you ought to be a teacher. And I thought, uh, I don't want to be one of those high school teachers or whatever. But then he took me aside as a senior and said, why don't you go into pharmacy school? And uh, I like chemistry and, and the sciences. And I told my mom about it. And she said, that's a great idea. And I thought, OK. But I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, in my hometown, there were two pharmacies. Each pharmacy was run by one pharmacist. Each pharmacy had a soda fountain. And it was a traditional old-fashioned pharmacy. And, and drugstore. Called a drugstore. That's exactly right. So I knew a little bit about it because I would enjoy the soda fountain, but that's probably all I knew. <laughs> but I went on to college anyway. And Where'd went you go? The tell, us, tell us about college and where you went. Uh, it was a college which was small uh, called South Dakota State, and it was called South Dakota State College in those days. Then it became a university. And what it is, and still is, is a miniature Purdue. Uh, it's a state school. Is it the land grant? It's the land grant state, state school with chemistry and sciences, engineering, home ec, as they called it in those days, and agriculture. And they had a pharmacy school, and they took in about 50 students and each uh, class. And so I applied and was admitted and started my, uh, my career as a student there. And in those days, uh, it, since we're talking about the past, we went for four years. I got a bachelor's in science or bachelor's in pharmacy, four years. None of this uh, clinical, none of the so-called PharmD as we have today, but a four-year degree, but a good degree and a good training. And once again, if you want to know the next step, uh, when I was a senior, uh, two professors took me aside. And they said, why don't you go to graduate school? And I thought, well, what is graduate school? I had no idea. And they said, well, you, you go get a master's from us and you continue to study and do research. And I thought, well, that's sort of interesting. I'm interested in uh, some of the courses. And uh, the one professor was very uh, excellent teacher in biochemistry. And I thought, OK, I think I'll try that. I had really no idea what I was going to gain and where it was going to take me. But I went on, and it was a two-year program. To get your master's, uh, you To mean? get a master's. And, and this one professor 
introduced me to something called radioactivity and radiation. And he said, well, you're going to do research. And what you're going to do is you're going to uh, add some radioactive materials to uh, rats, and you're going to follow this in the rats, and we're going to see how much of it goes into certain or organs or teeth, and, and we're going to do what we call tracer studies. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and I did it, and uh, he taught me how to do these uh, skills, and, and it's really an analytical skill. You can see where something goes, or you can quantitate it, how much is there. And then uh, I got my uh, master's uh, pretty much tidied up, and then they said, well, uh, you really should go on for a PhD. I thought, okay, I guess I should go on for a PhD. These guys are good. And they said, you ought to go to some place called Purdue, Purdue University. And I thought, oh, no. Had they, any, uh, can, had, had they been to Purdue, or did they? They were both Purdue PhD graduates from the School of Pharmacy at Purdue, uh -huh. unknown to me. And they told me Purdue is the place to go because this is where there's a great program in research, in knowledge, in training, in the use of radioactivity, in the life sciences, and in pharmacy. And I thought, okay, but I don't want to go to the East Coast, and I don't want to go to a private school. And they said, no problem, it's in Indiana. And I thought, oh, Indiana, that's still the East Coast to me. <laughs> And if I cross the Mississippi River, I'm going to be in the eastern part of the U.S. But I said, okay, I'll go anyway. And I applied and came here, uh, I must admit, in 1959 to start my uh, Ph.D. in what was called at that time the Department of Bionucleonics in the School of Pharmacy at Purdue. And a nice gentleman by the name of Johnny Christian took me by the hand, and he said, I'll help you and I'll take care of you. And he was the major professor for the gentleman who was my major professor at Purdue, at South Dakota State, by the name of Harold Bailey. So Dr. Christian took me by the hand and he enrolled, said you should take these courses and uh, got me acquainted with the faculty and with the students that were there. And for well, the tell first us your year, impression if arriving I'm on sorry. tell us your impression arriving on campus. Oh, I mean, how, did you come by train or by yourself? Oh, I, uh, interesting. My first time was with my mother. Yeah. We drove out here, and uh, it was it's quite a long trip. A long trip for us. In uh, no interstates. No it? interstates. And it was. I remember the first time uh, I saw Purdue. I came over Northwestern. Didn't know what it was. Northwestern, and I drove. It's a sort of the, up the hill of Northwestern where you start to go down and you see the campus. And I thought, there it is. <laughs> There's Purdue. Well, there wasn't any Mackey Arena. There wasn't any uh, football uh, place to practice. Uh, and uh, the, it was uh, quite different, but you could tell it was Purdue. And we could drive and park right on campus. Drove right up to the uh, pharmacy school, which happens to be now gone. It's, uh, part of the uh, student services right. and I parked in front of this uh, building which was an old uh, white barracks from World War II that I later found out uh, that very day had been reconditioned uh, to become the research and teaching area for this Department of Bionucleonics. So we did, we found the Dean's office, we walked into the Dean He's the only dean that was ever shorter than me, and his name was Jenkins. And Glenn L. Jenkins uh, greeted me and introduced me to his secretary, and it was the only secretary in the whole school. And Clara Henning was her name, come to think of it, and Clara was the dean's secretary. She ran everything, and including all the finances and everything. And uh, the dean then uh, uh, talked to me a little bit, and he says, well, I want to have a fellow named Patrick Belcastro take you around and show you our building and show you where you would be a graduate student. So he very kindly uh, took us around, which wasn't hard. And so it was an interesting experience because of uh, I met two very important people, including, of course, John Christian at that time. It was quite a, an impressive place because I had come from a college of 3,000 or at that time, and, and here I was at a, a university, which probably had 14,000 at that time. And uh, where they played basketball wasn't Mackey Arena, but it was still very impressive. And the football field was very impressive compared to what we had and the size of the campus. 
So that was my first impression. We drove back home, um, and then I came back by myself. Excuse me, did you find housing when you were there at the time? Did you oh, that was, that was an interesting thing, because I had a fellowship, um, and that fellowship didn't pay a lot, and they allowed me to become a uh, counselor in Kerry Quad. And I became the counselor in Kerry Quad B unit on the lower floor, and uh, spent my Purdue first Purdue year here as a counselor. Uh, and I was received free room and free food as a reward. And then I was paid uh, a bit of a, a stipend from my fellowship, and then the, the tuition was paid for. So I had a place to stay. It was very small, and I had about 50 freshmen who were freshmen who thought this was a wonderful opportunity to play pranks on one another and crank their music up and on and on. But uh, we all got along and it was a, a, good, uh, a good first year experience. Sure. It really helped because as a new person, it really brought me into Purdue and, and you and really it was got close to used to the you traditions. Were it was close to pharmacy too. Hey, it was a block walk. Sure, right. And, 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 you know, and we had the tradition of that time of the senior cords and the beards and the, and it was and the real, canes. And the canes. So it was, it was really fun. So uh, I had a great first year here uh, and uh, learned a lot. And uh, during the summer of that year, uh, I received a phone call from my major professor from South Dakota, and again, Harold Bailey. And he said, uh, Shaw, why don't you come back to South Dakota as an instructor and uh, do your research, and it's called Research in Absentia. I pretty well completed my coursework, and uh, uh, it was in the process of taking my prelims and other requirements. And so it was doable. And I went to Dr. Christian, and I said, Dr. Christian, I have this opportunity to go back. Uh, my, your former student, my major professor back there, has grants, and he would like me to come back. And he thought about it. He said, uh, OK. Uh, we'll be co-major professors. I will remain your major professor at Purdue, responsible for your uh, degree, and you'll go back to Dr. Bailey and he will be your professor at South Dakota. Didn't know at the time that was very risky because many times when you leave and do your research somewhere else, you get so busy doing your teaching or doing other things in life, you don't get your research done. But uh, Dr. Bailey was uh, adamant about we had to get this work done, we had a grant, we had to do this, and uh, we did. And we worked with uh, uh, seeming like, like hundreds of rats doing tracer studies of all the funniest things, looking at the influence of two drugs on tooth decay. And I would be responsible for looking at the radioactive aspects, of radioactive sodium, radioactive phosphorus as components. And, and Dr. Bailey would check the teeth with a microscope, obviously, for tooth decay. And we did enough research to crank out a good thesis for me and some papers. And I got my PhD coming back to Purdue uh, to take my orals. And I went back to South Dakota. I was still an instructor. And I thought, OK, I guess that's what I'm going to be. Uh, on the side, for a brief moment to digress from career, there was uh, these two professors were still there. One of their professors' uh, wife was a advisor to a women's group in pharmacy called Kappa Epsilon. And at that at one point during that year, I was there. She said, "You know, there's a girl, and she's a senior, and you really should date her." And being a good obedient young man, I said, I really should. Now remember, I've been told to become a pharmacist. I was told that I should become a teacher. And I was told to date this girl. Well, you can guess what happened. I called her up and she said, OK. And so during the year or so that I was working on my research, we dated. And she kindly, after the second time, agreed to marry me. And uh, we were married. And I was still there for another year. And, and we did the finalized research. And I went to, with my good new wife, to present my work at a national pharmacy meeting. And I thought, fully intending to say in South Dakota. And then this dean, the only one shorter than me, came up to me and he said, Shaw, would you consider coming to Purdue? And I thought, yeah, but you wouldn't ask me. <laughs> I said, yes. And he said, OK. And I went back to South Dakota. And he went back to Purdue. And I'll bet a month later I got this phone call from this dean. He says, 
I'm offering you a position as assistant professor at South Dakota, at Purdue, and I'm offering you $8,900 for a full year contract. And I sort of did, uh, 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 and he said, I'm not going to give you any more money. I'll give you two weeks to think about it, and I'll call you back. Well, I like to hunt pheasants. I'm the only boy and the only child. South Dakota is 800 miles from Purdue University. But we looked at it, and we went to Purdue. Okay. And I became an assistant professor at Purdue in 1962. Yeah. Okay, that leads into... That's a long story. No, that leads into now your research and also the nuclear pharmacy. Continue on with that. Well, you know, the research okay. when I came back here yeah. was really related uh, to tracer techniques following uh, radioactivity in living systems and determining where it was going, how much of it was there. And we tried and most of the time applied it to pharmacy. But uh, we had uh, op other opportunities because uh, during my t early years, uh, we became concerned about pesticides and the effect of pesticides on, on eggs and on the, remember some of that? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, we started working on environment. And, and what were, where were the pesticides going? Were they getting into the milk in cattle? And, and we did all kinds of very interesting tracer research but at the same time, and particularly with graduate students, I worked, I'd probably have 10 graduate students at a time, and we had a, a lot of graduate uh, work. But we had one small course, which we taught uh, our pharmacy students as an elective about radioactive drugs. They were horrible drugs. Uh, the, the radioactive atoms had what we call a long half-life, but that's because they were made in industry, shipped by car or airplane and then administer to a patient and so they had to be uh, have the radioactivity there long enough to be shipped and then to be given but we talked them and uh, so I was aware of this area of using radioactivity in medicine well in 1969 uh, a professor or in another two professors in fact at the University of South Carolina uh, Southern California uh, started a master's program in what they called radio pharmacy. And that what they said was a pharmacist uh, with a degree, PharmD at that time, or bachelor's degree, uh, could take a year of education and training and actually specialize in this area, which they called radio pharmacy. And so that got our interest. And so in 1972, uh, we said we can actually offer courses in this area to undergraduates because at that time the field was starting to develop and it wasn't as difficult and there is something called a radioactive generator was coming along and if we have time I'll share that but it allowed the pharmacist could to make the radio pharmaceuticals in the pharmacy or in the hospital and most of it was in the hospital in fact all of it was and we said we could train our kids to do that through electives and so we started offering courses in this area, and we didn't like radio pharmacy. It's like, turn the radio pharmacist on, turn the radio pharmacist off, and they were serving what was called nuclear medicine. And we said, why don't we call them nuclear pharmacist, which is what we did. And so I got involved in that in 1972. We started developing elective courses, and uh, at the same time, another gentleman in the University of New Mexico uh, who had come through the USC program uh, got the idea that he wanted to have the pharmacy, the state of pharmacy, recognize his nuclear pharmacy, and he called it a radio pharmacy, and the people who were in charge of radioactivity and, and the safety of, of Americans, and that time it was called AEC, Atomic Energy, Energy Commission. Commission, now it's called the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He said, I want them to recognize me as the license holder responsible for working with this, making the products and dispensing them. And he did it. And so in 1972, uh, the idea of standalone nuclear pharmacies or radio pharmacies emerged. And then our undergraduates were suddenly really in need because they started to, to uh, develop these in, in different cities and there was a need for pharmacists. And so it, at the same time then there was just 
to push to have pharmacy at the national level recognize us because they had no idea what this area was. This was just grassroots starting to grow. And so we worked very hard with APHA, American Pharmacist Association, to develop a recognition and a group that we could uh, call our own. And that started in 1974. And, we and had you were involved meeting. in that? I was right in the middle of that. It was a ball. And I had uh, many colleagues. I mean, I was just one of, of maybe 20 of us who were crazy enough to think we could do that. And uh, we, we got together and we promoted this and we had our first national uh, session, one day session devoted to our area in Chicago in 1974. And then in 1975, we petitioned for recognition as a group. And then the next step was we were the first group to then try to develop and develop uh, the documentation necessary to become a recognized specialty in pharmacy. Prior to that, pharmacy was pharmacy. It wasn't like a board certified pediatrician, board certified oncologist, board, of, board certified neurosurgeon. It was pharmacy. And pharmacy at the national level wanted to start to recognize and then have board certified. So nuclear pharmacy was unique. And we could say, yes, we have different training, we do different products, and we therefore went ahead and, and petitioned to be recognized. And I think that came about 1978. And then the next step was to make an exam. And, a, and all that was the for next step. For the certification. Step. And for certification, that took place, I think, in about 1981. And I just had the privilege of being involved in all of that. that it was nice? a very special right. time. Yeah. And I had no idea this was going to happen in my life. <laughs> That's very good. How about the enrollment? How did that impact on the school of pharmacy with the nuclear pharmacy? The enrollment increase? Well, was it undergraduate and graduate work as well? For uh, in, nuclear? In nuclear and yeah, at the school. Yeah, we had both. And mm -hmm. Because the specialty was starting to emerge, uh, it's not, it didn't impact the undergraduate program. It just gave those kids opportunities okay. to gain that specialty while they were undergrads. But then it did uh, bring to us uh, the specialty area of, of nuclear pharmacy and radiopharmaceutical research into the School of Pharmacy. And so we started having graduate students right. then. Getting and that leads and into PhDs. your certificate program too, does, did it not, at down the road? Well, and, it was down the road because right. uh, uh, we were turning out some fine uh, young men and women uh, what in sort of June. Yeah, what sort of jobs would they, were did they go into? Uh, By and large, large, they went to these standalone, so-called centralized nuclear pharmacies. And, and they would uh, be employed there uh, as they developed across the country. They could go many different places sure. and uh, be employed as pharmacists and also have opportunities to become the manager or to start their own. It was a very exciting, expanding time. So we had a lot of students and have a lot of students over the years that have gone into it as an undergraduate, fi having finished their degree. And then the master's and PhD as well. But in spite of the fact that we were turning them out in May or June, uh, and other schools too, uh, there was a need uh, for more people, and uh, they just needed them at other times. And so we thought we can provide education through uh, what we call distance learning. We could prepare our, our lectures by taping them and that time the videotaping and sending the videotape and the workbook so the student could take notes and, and watch and, and learn and then we would test them and the pharmacist at the site where the person was learning would be the preceptor responsible sure, for right. testing them and then after learning so much material then we would expect them to come to Purdue and spend two weeks with us and we did that because there were certain uh, instrumentation, certain hands-on experiences that we want to assure that they knew. And we wanted to really be sure that these people were getting quality education because they were Purdue kids and they're part of the Purdue family and we had this idea that we're good and we want you to be good. <laughs> Very good. So that really had a great impact on us. Yeah, right. Well, how is the field today? Has, has it really grown a lot over time? Oh, it Bring has. It, yeah. It's grown a lot. Uh, certainly from the first pharmacy, which existed in 1972, uh, there are hundreds of nuclear pharmacies, maybe 300 or 400. But at the same time, in relationship to uh, Walgreens or CVS, it's small. Uh, but it is a... Uh, it's a specialty. A specialty area that has grown 
and is across the country. It's available in smaller cities. It used to be in only large cities because there are only uh, nuclear medicine units in the larger hospitals. Mm -hmm. But because of the improvements in instrumentation and products, uh, smaller cities could uh, uh, utilize these services and, and have this available for the patients. Well, then that opened the door for a smaller nuclear pharmacy. And, th and the next thing about them is they're centralized. So if, if you're in, uh, and this has nothing to do with Indiana, but Cedar Rapids, or Iowa, you could service several small communities. Sure. And even Cedar Rapids isn't very big and, and still have enough of uh, a business to provide uh, the services and, and be sort of an independent. Right. But the larger ones in the, in the uh, ones that are so-called chains are probably in more larger communities sure. and service several hospitals, which helps again to have enough volume to make you uh, to make an economical, sure. feasible pharmacy. Right. So there, there's not hundreds, there are hundreds of nuclear pharmacists, but not thousands. Right, okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit, you were the, uh, uh, acting head of the School of Health Sciences. How'd yes. that come about and what changes did that impact on your, for well, you or on I, you? Well, there's two things associated with it. I'll start with the humorous part. It, okay. it taught me that I never wanted to be an administrator. Uh, I didn't mind. I enjoyed my experience. It was a, a, a wonderful opportunity because you had a, uh, an opportunity to work with people and to try help them. And it came about because of a president who won an election and it was the senior Bush and, uh, and then what, what, what Bush do we have today? Uh, I don't remember the initials, but the, his father was elected. And uh, the head of the uh, School of Health Sciences, Paul Zemer, uh, had national prominence in his field, which is health physics, the radiation protection field. And he was called by uh, President Bush uh, to become a high-ranking official in the Department of Energy. And that left a hole in the School of Health Sciences. And the dean at that time, Dean Rutledge, called me into his office and he said, I'd like to have you serve as the acting head while Paul uh, Zemer is gone. And he said, it'll only be about six months. And talk about ignorant. I said, okay. Well, it turned out to be three years. <laughs> and the only reason I guess that I ever gave it up was because then Bush was not elected to a second term. And I guess even as a Republican, I was rejoicing at that time. <laughs> because then Dr. Uh, Zemer came back and right. uh, I went back to doing my regular Which, duties. Sure. But I, uh, I didn't regret it. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to help my school. Uh, health Sciences uh, was a small school that's grown some since. Uh, and I was were familiar with it as I, because it was really grown out of bionucleonics. It became part of bionucleonics and then bionucleonics disappeared in a way and health science became the single entity. Sure. So it was a colleague, there were colleagues that I knew and I certainly taught in it and I wanted to be part of it and to help them. Right, very good. Okay, um, you had a couple of deans. Uh, you came with Dr. Jenkins but then Dr. Tyler was the dean for yes. a long time. Any comments? On, they were different, they probably different styles yes. so many of them bring to the yes. table. Yes, uh, definitely. I, I had dean Jenkins, Jenkins, was he the first dean of the was, school? No, 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 oh, no, oh, no. no. But he was a long uh, okay. dean of the school. He came aboard, I think, uh, right after World War II or, okay. or during, and he had a long tenure, at least 25 years. And a very prominent tenure, he brought the School of Pharmacy into prominence in graduate education, and many, many deans got became uh, from our school. Um, I knew him in his twilight years. Uh, he had a reputation of being pretty much a tough guy, uh, but I knew him as a little more benevolent person. <laughs> We mellow over Ooh, time. We mellow as time goes on. <laughs> I, and I could name faculty who've done the same. <laughs> uh, then Dean uh, Tyler came along in uh, 1966. Uh, I remember it because uh, when he was interviewing, my first daughter was born, my wife's first child. And I remember running up to tell him because I found him and his wife on campus that I'd become a father. <laughs> uh, he I was totally different uh, from Jenkins. Um, not that he wasn't uh, prominent in his capabilities and uh, in his guidance for the school. And, uh, in fact, as he took the school to another level, as uh, our former president Jeske likes to talk about, because he really fostered uh, the development of individualized grantsmanship. The School of Pharmacy in the past at Over Jenkins had become a team group. I came as a member of a team under Dr. Christian, but Dean 
uh, Tyler promoted and brought in faculty who were recognized nationally as prominent, uh, well respected in, by their peers to the, so that NIH grants and other granting could be attained. And so he changed the school considerably from that viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And it had to be done. Sure. Oh, yeah. uh, one thing about him uh, was his eloquence in speech. I am, did not have a dean that could speak more eloquently at the drop of the pen. If someone asked him to get up and say a few words about a matter, it was as if he had prepared all evening to give that 10-minute presentation. He was the most eloquent speaker I had, had had as a dean, very prominent from that viewpoint mm -hmm. and uh, very respected right. as a dean. And of course, you well know he went on to have a higher level. And he was a dean for, I think, another 25 years before he uh, terminated uh, his uh, services as dean. Sure. Uh, he was responsible for a lot of change. Uh, under Dean uh, uh, Tyler, uh, the school started to develop the uh, more, more clinical, more practical uh, experiences for our students, uh, the so-called externship where the student would be gone for one semester working in pharmacies, in hospitals, and in community. That was developed under his tutorage. And he had some great people to help him by name, like Bob Chalmers. I wish he was here to share. Uh, but uh, he really had a strong impact on that. Uh, he would have liked to head the PharmD, but it just didn't happen uh, uh, under him. Came on the next. Came on the next dean. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dean, dean Rutledge. Mm -hmm. And Dean Rutledge was my next dean. That's right. Literally, I had four deans. And I could have had five <laughs> if I'd have hung in there. <laughs> Oh dear. Let's talk a few bit about your honors. You're a fellow of the American of the Academy of Pharmacy practice. Now that's kind of cool. And you got your Distinguished Alumnus Award from the South Dakota State University. How yes. nice. That was uh, he, very special. And then you, I think that uh, Daniel P. Smith Practice Excellence Award is very nice. That was very meaningful because yeah. it's the top practice award in the, from the American Pharmacist Association. And as an academic person, teacher, more than a real practitioner, it was really a privilege to, uh, to accept that award. And I accept that award for my colleagues, for all the nuclear pharmacy colleagues who had a tremendous amount of work and effort to bring our field into recognition. Um, it wasn't my award, it was their award. That's, it's a team thing, that's very nice. And you got the Distinguished Achievement Award in Nuclear Pharmacy Practice also. Which is really nice. Well, that was from my colleagues, yeah. and that was uh, very special yeah. because that was recognition from the folks that I worked with over the years that uh, they appreciated what I'd done. Did you know in them. advance that they were coming, or was it somewhat of a surprise, or how did it? Uh, well, you you you. Do you have any? You clue? have an inkling, I think. <laughs> I get different uh, reactions but, to those uh, questions. You get a phone call one day, and uh, you don't know until you receive that phone call. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you participated at all as an alumnus of uh, both Purdue or South Dakota? Do you participate uh, at any uh, level? Yes, or? I do, oh. uh, particularly from my South Dakota school. Uh -huh. uh, I'm on the, the, the uh, dean's uh, council in the uh, College of Pharmacy back at South Dakota and uh, participate in Does that fun take work. you back uh, sometimes during yes, the year? Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. and, and they, of course, are interested in, in input, uh, but they're also interested in any assistance I can give them on raising funds and meeting people sure. And, sure. and promoting the school. And, and uh, it's been a great joy, and I, beyond that, and, 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 and w that also tied together with going back to a second time, I received a second award uh, from the College of Pharmacy in South Dakota State mm -hmm. as a distinguished alum. The first one was the uh, South Dakota Alumni Association. The second one was the, the College of Pharmacy itself. And uh, it got me back when the students, students were getting awards and recognition and fellowships. And I had a chance to talk to mom and dad and students. And it was so rewarding to, to uh, to have the opportunity to tell them about how great their school is and how much has happened and how proud uh, it is to, uh, I am as an alumni to go back there and to see the changes. And it's, it was a very special It's time. very good. It's very meaningful and very helpful. To, all right. Now the Stanley M. Shaw Fund in Nuclear Pharmacy. Now that's, a, that's very nice. That was very special. Right. Again. <laughs> and that came about uh, when I was re starting to retire 
uh, we uh, have our fundraiser in the uh, School of Pharmacy, and he uh, said, wouldn't you like to have uh, a scholarship in your honor, and uh, wouldn't it be great for the students? And when you start talking about great for the students, you got it. You got my attention. And I said, yes. That's what we're here for. Uh, that would be special. And uh, I said, okay, I will help and uh, lend my name and go with you. And we went out and visited a couple key uh, uh, former alums and uh, wrote some letters. And, and uh, he, of course, did the legwork on it. But it ended up that they raised enough uh, funds so that uh, we can have uh, a, a good uh, scholarship on a yearly basis for an undergraduate uh, from the School of Pharmacy who would have interest in nuclear pharmacy. And that uh, was brought into uh, reality when we had a retirement dinner in retirement banquet, and, and it was very special. Yes, that's very nice. How about family? Talk us a little bit about your family. Oh, I, I'm blessed with three daughters. Did they uh, go to Purdue? Two. Two did, okay. Two of the girls. The, anyone uh, in pharmacy? Yes. Okay. The youngest girl is a pharmacist. Uh, the middle daughter uh, went to Purdue in Cranford and became a, a CPA, uh, and she is a CPA at this point. The oldest daughter um, didn't quite know what to do, and she had been uh, majoring, in a sense, in high school and grade school in uh, piano and organ. and. So we said, well, why don't you go to a uh, university where you can continue your studies in music? So she went to Valparaiso and received her uh, degree in, in music, but with a minor in business. And she said, Dad, I can't make money in music. So she uh, went to work for, uh, in pennies as a, as a uh, what do you, you want to call it, business associate, and ended up going up different ladders, and, and so she is uh, in the business world, and the uh, the other girl is a CPA, and the young girl uh, practiced pharmacy for a while, and then she married a neurosurgeon, and uh, they uh, they take good care of her, so <laughs> it doesn't have to work. She's okay. <laughs> uh, how about a favorite Purdue tradition? Got one that you'd like to share with the researchers? Any Purdue tradition that comes to mind? Mm. A favorite Purdue tradition. Well, some of them are gone. I, I thought well, the, the, the one with the cords and the canes was a fantastic. I also really enjoyed at that time, which is also gone, the prominence of the floats and the efforts that the frats and the uh, sororities and the independents did to, uh, to make homecoming very special. Nice. It's still special, but some aspects of homecoming are gone, and uh, I, I miss that. Right. I think. Uh, the tradition that we maintain here of, in sports as, as a strong tradition, but not the tradition that overcomes academics, but complements academics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the tradition of uh, pride in, uh, obviously, the pride in the astronauts, but the pride in, in the accomplishments of each, each school, the engineering schools, the pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. you know, every school has its its graduates that have done well, and bringing these people back and honoring them is something each school does, and right. I think that's a great that's tradition. very nice. So nice. there are many aspects. Right, that's nicely said. Now, and the last thing, outstanding event in your life. How about that? Got an outstanding event? Most significant outstanding event in my life? If you care to share one with us. This is very difficult, but uh, the most outstanding event in my life would have been the suggestion from the faculty's wife that I ought to call a certain girl on the phone and ask her for a date. I believe that that would be the most significant out event for the, my right. life, Nicely. but I could name so many more. <laughs> Any closing comments that you'd like to share with the researchers and anything that comes to mind? Uh, I certainly would encourage a researcher at Purdue to be excellent in research but if at all possible, to be involved in the undergraduates, to get to know the students, to, be, to work with the students, to become involved in their organizations, to, to feel and enjoy the entire aspect of a major university. We can become so involved in research and we can become divorced from the students, but the primary person of a major person and reason for this university is education. Graduate education is important, but so also are those undergrads. Right. That's right. why we're here. Right. That's my important right. thoughts.
Thank you very much, You're Precious Shaw. My pleasure. This my concludes pleasure. it. Thank you very much.